Welcome back. This is lesson three on who is God. We're going to be on page 50 in your handbook. Uh, this is a bit of a tough lesson, and it's tough because by, by God's very nature, we can't fit God into our brain, right? We can't put him in a box. And so this lesson is, um, actually, I actually think this is one of the most difficult, like intellectually, like conceptually, this is the most difficult I don't think it's the most, maybe the most challenging where we go, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, but I think it is the toughest to try to wrap our heads around. So I want you to sort of quit before you get started. And what I mean by that is don't go, don't approach God uh, and say, I'm going to figure you out. Because if there was a God that you could figure out, that would not be God. Because God is greater than you, outside of you beyond your understanding, and so we, we can't figure out God. However, on the other hand, the Bible, we, when we talked about the Bible being special revelation or specific revelation to us, the Bible is telling us, here's who God is and what he's doing and how you relate to him. And so we, we do want to take what we can understand. Uh, we also want to have our vision of God expanded as we read the Bible. We want to get to know him better, and as we get to know him better, we see him more and more for who he really is, not for who we would make up uh, in our head. And we also, um, we're surprised, and we're, we're sometimes a little bit, uh, you know, we, we have trouble coming to terms with things, or there's things God says and does that, that can be tough for us to swallow, but that's getting to know any person. So we're going to say in this lesson that God is a person, and when you get to know a person, guess what? That person is, is not exactly who you thought they were. So we've probably all had that experience of um, you, you meet somebody, and maybe you have a good impression or a bad first impression of them. Um, to maybe take the analogy uh, in a different direction, maybe you, you see somebody and they're, they're, they're handsome, they're beautiful, you, oh, I think they're so wonderful, and then you start to get to know them, maybe you go on a few dates, let's say, and you go, wow, I was so attracted to you, but you are not who I thought you were, but I only, I built who I thought you were based on just a first impression or how you looked on the outside or how you just seemed um, just from what others said, maybe even, I don't know. But we've all had that experience where when you really get to know who somebody really is, they're not always your impression of them. And it's no different from w with God. When we really get to know God in his word and we get to experience him in our, in our lives and then see him through the lens of other people's lives, we get to know a God who's more, um, more full and multifaceted, has a lot more going on, than we originally thought. And so we're going to look at some of those facets. But first, we want to, we want to talk about God as a trinity. And so this is going to be a little, little difficult or very difficult, uh, but buckle up and don't worry. So on page 50, uh, I say this is something we, just a hard thing first that we've got to deal with is the trinity, the triune, sometimes we say, nature of God. That God is three, the term we use is persons, persons, in one, three persons in one. We would say that each person is fully God, and we would say that there is one God. This idea, uh, I want to make a, a, a few notes on this idea, and uh, the first is it doesn't make sense. So just take a deep breath, relax, this doesn't make sense. And I don't mean that it's impossible, I mean that it is beyond our conceptualization. We don't think of something that's three and also one all united. I would, however, say that when we're married, and, and for those of you who maybe have been married for a really long time, you might understand this better than uh, the rest of us in the class, uh, the Bible says that two become one when, when two people are married. And that, I think, gives us a good picture of, or the best picture maybe we can have, of God as, as two but one. And when you're married and you've, you've, uh, you've been together for a long time, you begin to kind of just know where the other person is, is at in a lot of ways, uh, but you're still distinct people. You're so used to them being there. You, you uh, kind of don't function perhaps as well without them, and yet you're, you're both uh, individual people. Uh, is that a perfect analogy of, of God and his, and his triune nature? Really, no. 
uh, but there is no perfect analogy. People have tried to come up with some over the years, um, and all of them have a flaw. Uh, so, uh, you know, people have talked about an egg, and they, they've said that an egg is um, has a yolk and a shell and a white part, but it's all one egg. The problem with that is you're saying that um, each part is so different, but you need each part to make an egg. God is not really three parts. He's, he's three people, but he's, he's one. So uh, we can't say that the shell is, um, the shell is 100% egg. I guess you, I don't know. You see how this gets weird? Um, there are three parts of the egg, and God is not three parts. He's one God with three persons who are completely and totally 100% God. Uh, people have also used the analogy of water, that water can be gas, water can, if you, right, if you steam it, uh, water can be liquid, and water can be solid if you make it uh, ice, um, which I believe ice is technically a plasma, but that's a scientific question for someone besides me. The problem with that is it's saying that, yes, it's, it's one thing, but it's in three forms, and so if it's in three forms, uh, we don't say that God is in three forms. We don't say that uh, sometimes he is God the Father, and sometimes he's God the Son, and sometimes he's God the Spirit. He is um, always God all the time. Not in, not, he doesn't change form or change from one uh, to the next. And so really what I'm getting at is there isn't a good analogy for the Trinity. However, um, that tells us something too. Because there's no good analogy, this is not something that we would have come up with and conceptualized. A lot of people will hear this doctrine and they think we're absolutely out of our minds crazy. We have no logic to us. And I would say no, actually, um, by coming up with, by not coming up with, but by um, describing it this way, uh, we would never describe it this way uh, for our own benefit because it doesn't benefit us. It seems too out there. We're not describing it. We're not coming up with this, but rather what's happening is we're piecing together in the Bible, and I'll give you some charts that kind of show, but we're piecing together in the Bible, hey, here's what's true about God, and also here's what's true about God, and also here's what's true about God, and if all of those things are true, how does that work together as one unit of truth? Let me give you an analogy for that, though. Um, you have here on the bottom of page 50, I give you the analogy of light, so if I told you, hey, science experiment, we have a, we have a, uh, I want you to figure out what it is I'm talking about here. If I said, okay, it's red light. You're like, okay, red light, easy. And then I say, it's green light. And you're like, but I thought it was red light. Okay. He's telling me it's red light and he's telling me it's green light. And if I said, you know what? It's also, it's blue light. You're like, wait, it's red light. It's green light. And it's blue light. How, what does that mean? Well, if we put those together, we get white light. We get one thing that's made up of the whole. That's not an analogy I'm trying to make for the Trinity. What I'm really trying to make there is an analogy for how we come to this doctrine, and actually a lot of other doctrines. We take the pieces in the Bible that seem to stand alone at first. Here's a, here's a basic statement, and we're going to see this again uh, at, uh, in a later part of this lesson on the nature of God. The Bible will say God is love. Okay, check. God is wrath. And you're like, wait, how do those go together? When we put the pieces together, we get a larger whole, we get a fuller picture. And that's what we're doing with the doctrine of the Trinity, is we're finding throughout the Bible these statements of God, these activities of God, and then we're saying, and these titles of God, and then we're saying, okay, if I put those together, I'm left with only this idea of a Trinity, because the Bible is clear that God is, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, there is one God. Okay, so we have to put those together. All right. All right, so let's get into this here, uh, the Trinity. So page 51, what do we mean by Trinity? Uh, when we talk about that, or the adjective we say is triune, tri, three, un, one, united, okay? Three, united, and one is the idea. This word, you got you to gotta understand, doesn't appear in the Bible. So the Bible doesn't say the word Trinity. Uh, like I said, we're piecing this together from the Bible as a whole. We're building what I call a network of truth, Okay. So uh, I gave you those statements. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There is one God. Uh, please, as always, always, always with these lessons, don't rely just on the video. Read through the, the, the actual handbook. Um, but yeah, that's where we're going to start. 
Um, the Trinity, as I said, shows that God is beyond our understanding. We don't, we wouldn't have come up with this. Uh, this is not something um, any other religion has. The what some have said is the closest equivalent is um, what's called the Hindu Trinity, uh, but really that's not that's really not the same thing as what we're saying anyway. Uh, so without going down the rabbit trail of what that is, um, uh, yeah. But it's definitely not something that we would have come up with. It's also, the Trinity tells us that God is one in nature but different in roles. That's going to become important. We're going to discuss that. Um, but meaning different roles and even different authority doesn't mean that you are by nature better or worse than another. And so, uh, yes, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in class discussion, but uh, really important uh, at least to say, hey, that informs the way that we relate to one another, especially when one of us has authority over another one of us. That's going to be that's going to be really important because, again, again, who God is is going to set the stage for how you and I are and how we interact with each other. So one in nature, but not the same in role. Uh, God the Father doesn't do exactly what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes and moves us. Uh, Jesus the Son uh, comes and shows us the Father. The Father directs the other two, and so different in roles. The next one down there says, one whose nature calls us to unity and diversity. And so because God is different and yet one, you and I have this value in our head of being different and yet one. So where do we get this idea from? Uh, it's around our society. Our money says e pluribus unum on it, which is Latin for out of many one. Uh, yes, they were talking about many people and really ultimately many states uh, being one country. But nevertheless, we, we seem to see a value in uh, coming together and gathering together and, and being unified. Where do we get that idea from? That's not some modern political idea. That's actually from the very nature of God, which is why in the church that thing is so important that many people and peoples and groups and ethnicities and, and all everybody comes together as one church. And I'll give you a couple of verses on that there, but that comes from God's very nature. On the next page, page 52, we say that God is relational. God is relational. God even relates to himself. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all relate to one another. God was not lonely, and that's why he created you and me. Rather, God had perfect relationship with himself, uh, and yet to exercise who he is um, and be glorified by and be, relation, be in relation with others outside. And even the Bible talks about to show the angels his nature. Uh, he uses us in our relationship with him. That's why we're going to talk next time uh, about how we're made in God's image. That's why you and I are by nature relational, because God is by nature relational. That's why so much of the Bible is going to come back to relationship all the time. Okay, so that was an important one. Uh, God both gives and receives glory, so God even glorifies himself. We see that Jesus glorifies the Father, and the Holy Spirit glorifies the Father and Son, and God raises up, you know, and glorifies Jesus, and, and they, they glorify within the Trinity. So we made in God's nature, we glorify God as well. Uh, God loves himself uh, and and is worthy of that love. And um, yeah, we, we, uh, we then, again, we'll talk about this kind of borders on next time, but uh, we're made in God's image. So we love and glorify God as well. And then we have some uh, shared characteristics of the Trinity, some things that they share. And this is not something I put together, but it comes from a, a, research, uh, a website called CARM.org, which is a Christian apologetics and research ministry. Um, and so just some things I think is this helpful. I won't go through them all, but you can see the chart there that um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's, there's multiple things in the Bible that apply to each one because they are all God. There's a few there on the bottom right that don't, you can see, don't apply to the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit is uh, still God, okay? So let's talk a little bit about God the Father. God the Father, when we say God, when, when we just talk about God kind of generically, we tend to mean God the Father. We could talk about God and refer to Jesus. We could talk about God and refer to the Holy Spirit. But um, usually in the Bible, we're talking about God the Father, okay? 
And so God the Father um, is, uh, we'll, we'll focus on the, on the bottom, those three bullet points there on the bottom. It says, because his very nature of that of Father, we see that God, one, is love. First John tells us that God is love. And your aim question underneath that is going to deal with the fact that many of us and many of the people you're maybe trying to reach with the gospel have a picture of their heavenly, uh, sorry, their earthly father in mind when they start to think of the heavenly father. And so they, they corrupt what God is really like. And the idea of father is not helpful to them. Nevertheless, God is our heavenly father. He's our perfect father. And so, uh, we know that that is just his, that's who he is. That's his nature, that he is love. As a father should be loving, the should be comes from the God who is a loving father, okay? Second, God desires to protect and provide. Jesus says that God uh, wants to give good gifts to his children, right? He He is our protection. He, uh, this is, this is as a father, you, you can take that picture you have of an earthly father to some degree and say, well, if an earthly father protects and provides, how much more uh, our heavenly father? And he's the ultimate authority. So even within the Trinity, God the Father is actually uh, telling the Son what to do, and the Son obeys him. He sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit obeys him. And so he's actually the authority figure there in the Trinity. Okay. Next, when you talk about God the Son, I've been using Jesus and, and the Son interchangeably. Jesus is, yes, it is his human name. Jesus the Son, God the Son, came and was born as a person, a human person named Jesus uh, of Nazareth, right? He was a historical figure. He's a, he's a human. You could touch him. He, he ate food. He's, 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 a, he's a human, but he's also God. We say God in the flesh. Or if you want to get a little technical, God incarnate. Um, so yeah, we can say Jesus, we can say the Son, but really same, right? And so he's both God and man. And that's important to have another chart here from Carm. Some things that are compared, and I think is a really important chart for you to read through. For instance, as God, he is worshipped, but as man, uh, he worships the Father. I have a little bit, I want to note that one because I have a little bit of an issue with that one. Because I don't think it's just as man that Jesus worships the Father. Uh, the Son of God is going to glorify God the Father even, even as he is God. Okay, So it's not just as man that he glorifies uh, and worships God the Father. Um, but uh, a, maybe a better one if we go a few down is where it says, As God he is sinless and as man he is tempted. And I think that's a more helpful kind of uh, example here. As God, he's completely sinless. The Bible actually says that God uh, can't be tempted or tempt anyone, and yet Jesus, we see, is tempted in the wilderness uh, by the devil. Hebrews also tells us that he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet remained without sin. And so um, I think that's a better way to look at it. In his human nature, he's tempted towards uh, wrong, but in his as he's divine, he's not going to go there. And that kind of also blows our mind and doesn't really fit. Well, how could, I don't know. And what, what people have tended to do over the, over the last 2000 years is either really emphasize Jesus as a human, or they've really emphasized him as God. The two extremes of that are both completely wrong. So the extreme is that he's only human and he's just a good teacher. And, and that's not uh, possible. Because uh, if he's just a human good teacher, then what he said about himself is not true. And if what he said about himself as God is not true, then he's not a good teacher because he's a liar or he's incorrect. Okay. The other extreme is that he's, he's only God and he never had a physical body and he never died on the cross and he's just divine and he, he, anything about him being a man is an illusion. That was actually a popular idea uh, in the first century. Uh, and actually, Muslim people believe that Jesus did not die on a cross, that it was a, an illusion or a substitute was provided because in their mind, God could never die. Well, we're saying that he is both God and man. And so as man, he's able to die. Uh, and as God, he's able to uh, pay for our sin. And so, um, yeah, does that, does that, is that difficult? Of course, it's difficult. But I think that chart is, is helpful there. Um, okay. What, what does it mean that he's both God and man? It means that Hebrews tells us he can understand us and help us because he's completely powerful, but also able to relate to us. 
Hebrews talks about them, him as a great high priest who um, has experienced life as we have. Okay, uh, He works in what I call the cosmic as well as the concrete, outside of time and in the world he created. So Jesus, you know, it, if, if he's going from point A to point B, it took him whatever time it would take you to walk from point A to point B. In John 11, it says that Jesus took two days to get from uh, where he was to, to go to his friend Lazarus. And so he's, he's within our world. He's within time. He's within, you know, there are things that, you know, people go, well, could God make a rock big enough that he couldn't lift it? You know what? That's kind of a silly question. Uh, but are there things that Jesus wouldn't have been able to lift? Was he just like, I will lift this building? No, he's a human. He's, he's subject to that. He got hungry. He got tired. He had emotion. He's, he's, he's human as well, right? That's going to, again, we're going to talk a little more next week. It'll help a little bit when we talk about um, us being made in God's image. And so him be coming in the form of a man, uh, some of that will get fleshed out. Uh, he lives as a sinless man, um, but he pays for our sin as a sacrifice. Uh, in order to be a sacrifice, he has to die. In order to die, he has to be human because God can't die. And us, again, being made in his image are not completely unlike him. Rather, we share much with him. And we're going to talk in this lesson in the second part about God's attributes and how some of those attributes we don't share and some we do share. Or you could say there's a scale of us sharing some more and some less. Okay. What did Jesus come to do? I'm going to let you read through that. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. You can read a lot about Jesus. However, what, what I want you to know on all of these as we kind of approach the Holy Spirit on page 40, uh, 57, um, you're like, oh my gosh, you're saying that who God is is the most important thing and everything else comes from that and you devoted just a few pages of this book to it? Yeah, because of a few things. One is because it has implications for everything else, it's going to pop up in a lot of other places. So as we go, I'm just laying some groundwork here, really. But as we go throughout the class, uh, we want to always root things back to God's nature. And so it's, it, it doesn't only get, you know, kind of short shrift here. It's going to be really foundational to our foundations class, right? Uh, And also, uh, the Bible describes God uh, sometimes very directly, but very succinctly, meaning it doesn't tell us a, a ton. Uh, and so we actually don't need a ton of space to describe what the Bible says about God, but we need an entire Bible in order to show how God enacts those things and lives those things. Does that difference make sense? The Bible can say God is love. That's three words in First John, but our entire Bible shows us how God is uh is being love to his people okay uh, i hope that i hope that makes sense so yes we can actually describe god's attributes briefly and who god is and what he does okay uh here page 57 god the holy spirit so uh, we sometimes say third person of the trinity however it doesn't mean the holy spirit is less god than god the father and god the son the holy spirit uh we sometimes kind of yeah kick to the side a little bit However, some churches, and you may come from one, the Holy Spirit, you would almost think the Holy Spirit was the only game in town, the only, the only God, that uh, the Holy Spirit becomes so important uh, and our experience of him becomes more important than um, how Jesus is revealing God in the word uh, or our glory uh, and obedience for God the Father. And so we want to allow the Holy Spirit to be in our lives, not allow, like, you know, allows the wrong word, but we want to make sure we understand that he's equally God uh, and a God that we do experience, but not on a higher, you know, we're not talking like higher, lower here. They're all God, right? Okay. So the Bible uh, shows that the Holy Spirit is God. And you can look at some of those verses there when you, when you want to. What does the Holy Spirit do? I'll let you read through all of that. Uh, He's God in us. Page 58. So we often tell kids um, that, you know, Jesus lives in your heart. That's not wrong. That's not, like, horrible. And the Bible does say that that, uh, Christ lives in us. But I think more specifically, it's it's the Holy Spirit that lives in us. He's the one that we really experience. Uh, And yet, again, the Holy Spirit is one with God the Son. And so... Are we experiencing God the Son and God the Father and experiencing God the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do we understand how that works? Not exactly. 
Um, but it's more probably more accurate to say that it's the Holy Spirit that lives, moves, works, guides in us. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, there's some controversy over that, but. I think what I, I want to say is a couple things. One, the Holy Spirit's mysterious. So sometimes where controversy comes from is two different groups saying that they've got it all figured out. And I have precious little respect uh, for viewpoints that say they've got everything about God figured out and nailed down in a box. Uh, then that's not God. And so if the controversy comes from that place of saying, I know exactly how the Holy Spirit works. No, I know exactly how the Holy Spirit works. You're probably both wrong because the Holy Spirit is mysterious to us. Um, and I want you to uh, run with that because the Holy Spirit is also experienced by us and in us and lives in us. And so allow him to surprise you. Ask the Lord uh, maybe this week to uh, move in you to if you've never heard him guiding you, if you've never felt empowered by him, if you've never, um, if you've never experienced him uh, we would say speaking to you, and we can talk a little more in class about what that means, but um, ask the Lord to, to to surprise you a little bit. If, on the other hand, your uh, understanding of the Holy Spirit really has brought you to a place where you ignore Scripture and you ignore, um, you ignore the advice of others, perhaps, uh, ask the Lord to surprise you by using those other elements alongside the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, okay? Holy Spirit's not something for us to be freaked out by. You know, sometimes we go, well, can't you get weird with that? Uh, you can. You can when it's really coming from you. This is where it gets weird, in my opinion, is when it's really just um, a, a contrived thing that we're trying to be, you know, Holy Spirit filled. Instead of saying, Holy Spirit, fill me, and then whatever happens, happens, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, take me wherever you want, do in my life whatever you want, uh, give me the gifts that you want, do th through me things that you want, show me things that you want. Um, and so when it's of him, uh, I don't care how weird it is, that's him. But if it's of you, then uh, that can be weird. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we can chat about it. Um, but nevertheless, I'd say the bottom line is the Holy Spirit's mysterious and yet experienced. And so ask the Lord um, for him to move in you. Okay. Uh, starting on this next, this next part, uh, and this used to be a whole other lesson. Uh, this is the attributes of God. Attributes I would define here is a person, thing, group. Oh, sorry. Uh, something attributed as belonging to a person, thing, group, etc. A quality, a character, characteristic, property. Um, what is this about you? So um, an attribute of, of Andrew is uh, he thinks a lot. Okay. Um, an attribute of somebody else might be that they are very strong and, and, and agile and athletic. I am not. Uh, so we can have different attributes. There are different lists of God's attributes. Uh, the reason there's different lists is because, A, these aren't listed out in the Bible. B, you can put some together or separate some out. So, for instance, I put in here love and mercy together, but other lists that people have made might separate those as, as two different things or even three, love, mercy, grace, okay? I did that for the sake of not making you read a ton and not making this super duper long, uh, but you can find different lists. There are books on this. Uh, the most famous, I think, is by a guy named A.W. Pink, Arthur Pink. Uh, he's uh, dead now, but he wrote a book in the past called The Attributes of God. It's not actually super duper long, uh, but that's one that you could you could pick up if you wanted to look more at, well, what does the Bible say about God? And that's what we're asking here. What does the Bible say about God? I want you to understand something, and this is really a thing. I want you to pay attention here. So if you're driving, pull off the freeway. If you're shopping, put everything back on the shelf and listen. Just kidding. But I really want you to hear this because this has been a point, as I've taught this class several times, this has been a big point of misunderstanding for a lot of people, a big sticking point where a lot of people... Um, they think they get it, but they, uh, in explaining what they think they get, I realize they don't get it. And so I really want you to pay attention to this box that says unity on the bottom of page 60. I'm going to read it to you because I think it's that important. It says, in God's nature, there are attributes that seem to be opposites. For example, mercy and truth, justice and grace, wrath and love, glory and humility, invisibility and beauty. 
So they, those seem, right, like, well, how could how, those don't go together, okay? It says, just as God is three persons united, God can be described with multiple attributes, but he is all of these things in equal measure at one time. Keep in mind that our tendency will be to think of God as being partially one thing and partially another, or that he changes, or that each person of the Trinity has different attributes. But no, God is all of these things, okay? So we will tend to say, God is sometimes wrathful and sometimes loving. No, God is always both of those things 100%, okay? Other people have told me that God is the right balance of these two different things. So he's the right balance of glory and humility. No, God's glory comes in his humility, okay? They are, they are you cannot separate them out. Um, God is both of those things in equal measure all the time. And so, no, it's not a balance, nor is it that he changes from one to the other. However, God does change sometimes which one he's kind of got on display for us or the which one he's maybe more in that time treating us with. For instance, um, God will treat his, uh, his believers with love and no wrath, but he will treat the world with, in the end, wrath and no love, uh, he will treat the Son with wrath and no love, Jesus on the cross, so that he can treat you with love and no wrath. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. There, you know, Jesus, we say the first time came in humility, and when he comes again, he'll come in glory. But ultimately, he really comes in both of them, both times. The first time Jesus comes in humility, which is his glory. He's, we glorify him because he's so humble, which amazes us. The second time he's going to come in his glory, but he's going to bring all of us lowly people up uh, to his level with him, which is a humble thing in itself to share glory with us, right? So always both of those things. So I want you to see that and understand that as you go through this list. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these uh, individually because that would be kind of long, but I want you to read through it. And I just want to give you the basic kind of uh, outline of how, how I have it here. And I'll make one more note on shared and unshared, and we'll leave it at that for the lesson. Okay. You have in each box uh, a title of, um, of what we would typically call this in theology language. Okay. By that, I mean not something the Bible says, but something that people who have studied the Bible have used this term over the years. And then you have on some of them that are a little bit, that term doesn't really make sense on its own. I tried to give you a simpler version in parentheses. So in the first one, you have independence, and I wrote self-existence. So independence doesn't mean like, you know, I, uh, you know, God is off on his own, and I don't know what else you would mean, but whatever. Uh, it means that he is, uh, he exists in and of himself. He doesn't need anybody uh, to exist. He doesn't need anybody to help him. He doesn't need anybody to uh, to define him. Uh, he exists on, him, uh, on his own. So I give you kind of a little blurb. A lot of those little blurbs, for, for fairness sake, a lot of those are quoted from Wayne Grudem Systematic Theology. So a guy named Wayne Grudem, uh, he wrote a one-volume systematic theology, which if after this class you're like, I really want, can I, can you give me a little more? Can I have a little more beefy version of this? There are a bunch of books out there, and I could recommend several, but uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology is very uh, readable and yet thick. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all the theology in there, but I could still uh, confidently recommend it to you. So you have a little blurb of what it means, and then you have where you see this in the Bible. I took a main verse for each 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 attribute that I felt like was a good primary example, and I quoted that in full for you so you don't have to look everything up. And then I gave you a few other kind of, if you want a few more verses, each one has some other places you'd see it in the Bible. Then some implications for us, uh, which uh, I really, I really want you to read. <laughs> I really want you to read the book, and I really want you to read those because uh, as I said, I want you to get this picture. I want you to get this understanding that who God is spills out into who you are and what you do, okay? And so take a look at those. And then each one has a little blank at the end. That's if you see another thing. So I'm not the be-all, end-all. I'm not the most brilliant person in the world. So if you see another implication, if you go, oh, if God is that, then that means this for me, 
write it in there. That would be, you'd be like the most star student. And I will try to ask you in class if anybody came up with any extra uh, things that these things mean for us. Okay. So the first section are ones that are not really, don't really apply to us, meaning we don't really share these. They're not really things that we are. So if God is unchanging, well, we're change, we, we change. Um, if God is eternal, uh, that one's kind of a yes and no because we're eternal because he gives us eternal life, but we haven't existed forever. Um, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere, but we are not. I am here. You are there. Uh, he's omnipotent, but we are not, but we do have power in the Holy Spirit. So kind of yes, kind of no. Omniscience, he's all-knowing. We are not, but we can learn and have wisdom. Um, okay, so that's where this box on page... 64 kind of comes in handy. It says the above attributes are those that we do not share with God, or I guess I could say, say we share less so. Uh, and those below are ones that we do share or share more so. Okay. Uh, and so I want you to, I want you to kind of look through those and uh, separate those out. If you want a nice theological term, the term is communicable and incommunicable attributes. You do not need to know or memorize that. But think of like a communicable disease or an incommunicable disease. Can you communicate it to somebody else? Meaning, can you give it to somebody else? Can you pass it along, right? So are these attributes passed to us or not passed to us? Again, I, some guy, some folks will, will make these really hard lines, like these ones are and these ones aren't. I feel like some are more so and some are less so. Uh, and so these are the ones here, when I say shared attributes, that we more so share with God as we're made in his image. Um, spirituality, invisibility, uh, truthfulness, goodness. Read through, see what I mean by those, see what we're talking about. Um, not a super long list, so I really do want you to, uh, to read through that. Mercy, grace, patience, holiness. Um, if you're going, gosh, those don't sound like me. Um, well, we can talk a little more in class, but uh, those are ways that God has made you, even if your behavior doesn't always line up, okay? So God has made you, so for holiness, God has made you to um, understand right and wrong, to know that he is holy, to, um, to have purpose. Part of holiness is being separated for a purpose, and you are separated to God for a purpose. You are called to be perfect, um, and you've actually been um, deemed righteous and holy and perfect, uh, in his sight, even if your behavior, again, doesn't always line up. And so he's going to work on your behavior. We'll talk about this in another lesson. So if you're like, these don't sound like I share them with God, you do because this is how you are made to be. Okay. They do because again, this is how you are made to be. All right. Uh, peace and order, uh, righteousness, justice, and wrath. You can read through these. I won't go through them all. And we'll get down to the bottom. Da, 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 Okay. Um, your homework is do something this week that can help you enjoy God and something to reflect one of his attributes. This is a little bit vague. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, find something about in one of these attributes, any of them, and go, uh, okay, this helps me enjoy God. For instance, um, if I go and, and, you know, take a drive and look at the, you know, Ortega Mountains next to us and I say, oh, God is a God of, of beauty, Right. And he makes beautiful things and I enjoy them, okay? Uh, or uh, if uh, I pray to God about a difficult situation and I know that because he is all-knowing that he knows what to do and will give me wisdom, I can enjoy God in that and rest in him in that, okay? And I want you to do something to reflect one of his attributes. Now, this sounds like, well, how do I do that? I'm going to give you a real simple example. God is a God of order. Is there something in your life this week that you could bring some order to? Yes, as simple as could you organize something in your house? You're like, that doesn't sound spiritual. It is. It is. As we reflect God, um, we bring order. Could you bring more order into a relationship? Could you make peace a little further in a relationship? Could you reach out in mercy to somebody who's hurt you? Could you... These are the things we do that reflect who God is. It can be something big and hard. It can actually be something small and easy. But try to find something this week that helps you um, reflect who God is. Your memory verse is Exodus 15, 11. It says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? 
who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. And then you have our statement of faith on God, God kind of generally, generically, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So you can take a look at that from our statement of faith, and I will see you next time.